University. Uh, well, we have uh, Gernot is uh, well known in the, in the topic of uh, handwriting recognition, document analysis. But actually, today uh, the, the talk uh, will not be on, on this topic. Uh, it's a topic that I think is uh, probably uh, more interesting for, for the whole uh, CDC. Uh, he's here uh, with Leonard. Uh, most of you know Leonard because Leonard was here two years ago for a research stay for uh, discussing on some uh, ongoing uh, uh, collaborations. And uh, oh, that's it. Thank you for, for your visit and for your talk. Taylor, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, also thank you very much for inviting me to the CVC and to give a presentation here. And actually, uh, it, it's not about handwriting recognition today, but it can be, let's say, linked to handwriting recognition, but it's a bit more general topic, and I'd like to talk to you a bit about semi-supervised learning, which is a, a topic that is not so much perceived in research, but it's, uh, in my understanding, very important. I'd like to give a, a short introduction. Why, why is this important? Why do we need that? Um, I will go a bit into the fundamentals, so what kind of techniques are around. Uh, then I will propose a few methods that we um, developed over the years, and here I have to say that this is a joint work with um, uh, mm, a staff people of mine, so it emerged all from collaboration with Silat Voider and John Richards, and now it's uh, most uh, of the work I'm doing together with a PhD student, René Grestzig. Um, afterwards, I can show you some results uh, that we obtained, which we are quite happy about, and I will give a short conclusion. Yes, um, why do we need that? If we are looking at current approaches to pattern recognition, we are all quite happy about that because we don't have to hand design stuff. Uh, we learn from example data, we apply statistical methods, and at that point, things look fine. Uh, even the next point is quite uh, positive, actually. Uh, if we look into that, uh, we see whenever we increase the number of samples that we're putting into something, usually, if we don't do anything wrong, the quality of results will improve. Uh, and this nicely relates to a famous statement of Robert Mercer from IBM who says, there is no data like more data. Uh, so you can't have enough data. Uh, and if you have this infinite amount of data, uh, you're, you're fine with statistical methods. You train everything. On the other hand side, if you look at the machine learning part, uh, people scratch up more and more crazy ideas of what kind of more and more complex models we could have. And then there is also this notion of big data, which is a current buzzword, um, and which is not directly that uh, image databases uh, increase. They mean a little different stuff. But anyway, it also is a bit of a sort of big data. So data collections really are available now in <coughs> sizes that are substantial, uh, not only 10 images. Now, the question is now, this looks all like there would be a bright future. But unfortunately, I don't think so, no? because we have some problems. Uh, and there are at least two in my understanding. If you increase model complexity, not everything will be bright because on the uh, downside, you know that you definitely require tons of data to train the complex models. So it will also increase your data hunger of your methods. And the more serious aspect in consequence of that is, well, it's not only enough to have the data available, but you have the, have the annotations too. Uh, and therefore, it's only working in the current approach uh, that you also have data labeled by experts in infinite amounts available. Mm? And this is probably not what you have, uh, and therefore, we have to do something about it. Interestingly, this is not a problem that uh, people will discuss widely, uh, and therefore, the question is, um, what is the problem statement that we have? So we need labeled data for training these highly complex recognition models. The labeling um, causes a tremendous effort in doing so because we need human experts. And the huge collections that we usually are thinking about as being huge, and this might be cool, uh, are usually unlabeled. Mm -hmm. So it's only the data, unless you do something about it. And this is effort. And if you now say, OK, I heard something, there is also training without labels, which is called unsupervised learning. To some extent, you can do with unsupervised learning, but an unsupervised procedure will never be able to infer real labels for your data, uh, unless you give it some way the link to what your understanding of that percept in the real world is 
Uh, no unsupervised machine can ever infer that automatically. So there is obviously a problem, no? but we, we don't seem to have it uh, really pr present in the discussion, and therefore the question is why is it not so much perceived? And yeah, <laughs> you probably know. Uh, you, in science, will find somebody to label the data, either for real money, uh, Amazon and Mechanical Turk might help, uh, some PhD students, uh, probably you all have had some labeling experience lately. Uh, some people had really creative ideas, they ask their mother uh, to help a bit with the labeling efforts, so that's really true, it's not thinking up. So from the Toraba group there is a paper where he shows that his mother is especially precise in labeling image data in contrast to other crowdsourced people. And if, if, it, if you say in academia everything is fine, then the question is in the real world, why is it also fine there? In the real world, there are just companies uh, that have business models that involve users and the users somehow voluntarily give labels uh, to the data. And if you have that, uh, so the big data crawlers like Google and Facebook also don't have the real problem of learning from data without labels. And if you have enough labeled data, you might know you can do crazy things. Uh, for example, this here. I, I like that very much. Uh, this um, paper from Toralba and others about the 80 million tiny images project, it shows you if you collect enough images, in this case roughly 80 million, it was not, not really 80 million, it was only 75 million, 79 million, whatever images. But anyway, you scale them down to small size and you more or less do nearest neighbor later. Such a primitive classifier as nearest neighbor can already do a lot of classification for frequent classes, only by having available enough data. That's very impressive. There are some tricks in the comparison, but anyway, it's the amount of sheer amount of data that helps in this case. <coughs> also, a very challenging problem in itself, uh, labeling scenes, uh, and in this case, not only classifying it, but labeling scenes with respect to uh, the classes that you see, buildings, road, whatever, people, I don't know, sky, uh, vegeta vegetation, etc. If you cast this problem also into a nearest neighbor solution case, you could say, uh, because you have enough images of scenes that are already labeled. Uh, you can simply find the most similar scene, uh, grab the labels for that scene that you already have, and transfer it by some warping procedure, which is probably not completely trivial, but it, which is also not magic anymore, to your new data. Uh, so you have a sheer amount of labeled data, and some problems become not easy, but they are probably directly cast in a very different setting. Uh, so uh, they are not um, a learning problem anymore. Yeah, now let's look at an example that is, however, different, uh, which you might also encounter in the real world. A real world problem looks like this, for example. This is one shelf, a real shelf, in a cellar in Hamburg, Germany, and we had the chance to work with a very, very tiny fraction of that data uh, a while ago. This is weather recordings collected by the German Weather Service, and they have dozens of those, uh, and they are full of volumes, let's say, dozens of volumes per shelf, and, and again and again, so that's tens of millions or even billions of pages. And if you want to uh, record um, from that weather statistics that were recorded by hand over the years, and the German Weather Service boasts that it has uh, the largest collection in the world of historical weather observations all around the world, um, you want from that to uh, derive, uh, let's say, uh, statistics of the weather in the old days, more or less, in order to predict something about the future for uh, So more or less you have to somehow transcribe or annotate the documents. It probably hasn't to be 100% precise, uh, but you have to do it somehow. And the solution that they are currently following in, in, let's say, very, very small steps and scales is sometime in between. They scan a few pages, sometimes body sits down and hacks the stuff into an Excel sheet. Uh, so you know that they will never finish, huh? <laughs> never ever. Therefore the question is can we reverse, let's say, the effort between the human uh, in front of the machine with the Excel uh, so that the, the machine does most of the part and the human does least of the effort. And that was one uh, problem that we were facing a while ago and we said, okay, obviously this is something we need semi-supervised learning. We have only a few labels and we have a lot of data. Now, semi-supervised learning, let me give you some ideas um, how this relates to other learning strategies. And I, I borrowed this example from a book by Shu and Goldberg 
from 2007. Uh, the example goes like this. Huh? You are a, a space traveler. You come to your new planet, and uh, the planet is populated with little green aliens. And you so see here a plot. Uh, somehow, you look at the aliens, and you see how tall they are. That's not, not so uh, surprising. But you uh, somehow also observe their weight, probably by the footprints that they make on the surface of the planet. Uh, and if you look at them, they are all more or less little and green, and more or less fat, or whatever you could say. Um, if somebody then tells you that part of those aliens are the female ones, so that they are a little taller and a little fatter, and the, the males are a little smaller and a little thinner in this case, um, then this is a perfect situation. Uh, you fire your favorite classifier, and you get a decision boundary for the two classes, males versus females. If nobody would tell you anything, uh, you could say, OK, let's go with supervised, uh, unsupervised uh, method. Uh, and you could get this result. Looks pretty convincing. But this is not the only result you could get. You could get any other result that somehow groups the data. This one, which is uh, not perfectly bad, but anyway, uh, this is also not terribly bad. But uh, it's not really showing clearly that we have two classes anymore. And it could be even uh, more uh, diverse. Therefore, the question is now, um, obviously, with unsupervised alone, we get any number of clusterings here and with any relations. Uh, but we never will be able to infer that there are at least males and females. It could be also what a greenish inside or bluish outside, whatever things. Uh, therefore, we at least inject some labels. And we need at least two uh, for one class, one label. So we have one female exemplar and one male exemplar now labeled. And um, a very simple strategy for uh, semi-supervised learning is just to propagate the labels to similar stuff. Uh, and if you say similar is what is nearby, let's propagate the labels to nearby exemplars. And we propagate, and we propagate. And if you are, whatever, lucky in this case, um, and a bit conservative, you might end up with that solution. And you can say, oh, great, we solved the problem. Semi-supervised learning is doing as well as we expected from completely supervised, no labeling effort anymore. Unfortunately, this situation is a bit, a bit theoretic in the case uh, that we have rather well separated these two, let's say, uh, elongated class uh, regions. And let's now introduce only one outlier, you know, such a maleish, female, whatever thingy, uh, which is not completely clear, or, where, or probably it's also not completely clear that the males are so much thinner than the females, so we have some outlier there. You propagate again, you propagate. Uh, you might hit your outlier with one of the labels, and then you can't prevent that it might happen uh, that the labels spread to the wrong class. And you end up with something like this. Uh, so in the real world situation, just propagating uh, doesn't tell you that uh, you propagate in the right direction because you effectively don't know anything about the, the far away part of your feature space, let's say. Uh, therefore, this is a bit dangerous. And we can't do that directly. Therefore, let's look at what people proposed for doing semi-supervised learning. So what we saw here is um, uh, something which is actually a primitive version of so-called label propagation. You iteratively propagate the labels from the label to the nearby unlabeled data. And if you use a nearest neighbor criterion, some greedy sample selection, you're getting something which we saw. Uh, you could say, OK, it's only the greedy selection that is wrong. We have to select more intelligently. You might fiddle around some uh, things, and you might uh, solve some solutions, but not really. A more advanced method is uh, this local global consistency thingy by Chu and others, which was uh, published in NIPS 2004. And so the data points are there arranged in a graph with pairwise distances, and the label assignment is cast in a classification problem per label category. And these are then iteratively updated uh, by computing, let's say, in a local neighborhood, some weighted average of the labels. And the maximum over the labels gives you the final label assignment. And we will later compare to this method, which is quite good, actually, co uh, compared to the naive, greedy um, sample label propagation. This is one version to say. Another version is to do something like uh, co-training. Co-training is uh, you rely on, let's say, an external expert to some extent for the one view on the data. Uh, and in this case, you have two classifiers. Huh? The one uh, classifies the data from his point of view, and the other does it from the other point of view, which means that you have to uh, require two views on your data representation. Huh? So you can't do that in the same feature space. Therefore, the classifiers are. Um, hopefully producing 
uh, complementary hypotheses because they use different data representations. Um, and the classifiers also can generate confidences and uh, you can constrain that problem uh, to only top N hypotheses that extend the other classifiers training set. Otherwise, if you don't do that, the one classifier generates the training data for the other and vice versa. And so they iteratively uh, extend their labeled uh, view on the, on the data. You can extend that to more than, uh, one, uh, more than two classifiers, uh, which means that you do multi-view training. Uh, and there, an additional effort, uh, and not effort, benefit is um, that the multiple views can be used as a sort of ensemble decision. Uh, and the uh, confidence of the ensemble decision is easily measured by how many of the ensemble uh, classifiers agree on, on something. And there you have the, an easy way to measure some uncertainty about the label assignment. Um, a bit of a different uh, view on semi-supervised learning is uh, if you acquire actively the labels. You know, and uh, usually um, things are, let's say, a bit rephrased in this case of the so-called active learning uh, because the labels are not there uh, and you propagate from the existing labels. Uh, but in initially all the data is unlabeled and you query labels for specific things where you think that a label is beneficial for you to explore this data set. Um, the question is now to query which labels, and obviously you should query labels for sable, uh, samples that are relevant for labeling more, most precisely everything, and they usually lie somewhere near, let's say, class boundaries or something. Um, and two rather prominent methods are the so-called uncertainty sampling. So if the current labeling procedure, classifier, whatever, is most uncertain about a special instance of your data, uh, then it's probably wise to have a label from the expert. Um, or if you have this multi-view thing, which is rather similar, um, if the, the committee, the current committee of classification uh, disagrees most on one sample, then it's okay uh, to say, yeah, or obvious to say, uh, this is probably a point where I need a new um, labeling. There is a rather uh, advanced uh, version of that, which was published recently, which is interesting because it's especially um, also considering a quite challenging task. Usually these semi-supervised learning things are mostly uh, evaluated on small benchmarks, even synthetic data. And here the, also they consider an object recognition task with, on a large data set. Uh, it combines this uh, label propagation that we saw before with an element of active learning and uses uh, uncertainty and the density criterion for sampling the new labels. Unfortunately, and this is really the downside of this method, uh, and I'm sorry to have to say that, uh, the sampling of uh, the new or the selection of the new samples to label is dependent on what kind of labels you're seeing in the test. And therefore, the test data somehow influences or can influence actually the decision. So it's biased towards the test scenario, unfortunately. Otherwise, it would be really a cool method. Um, yeah, what have we proposed over the years? So we started a uh, small scale, you could say. Um, but we followed a few principles that are still somehow valid today. Um, we said a uh, multi-view approach might be interesting, uh, so we want to explore uh, information from different representations. Um, we can then base the label assignment on agreement. Um, we rather early included elements of active learning so that uh, you don't uh, just start with some uh, labels that are uh, pre-given, uh, but you actively query for some labels. And we, complement, um, uh, we combine complementary semi-supervised approaches into a complete system for assigning the labels. And then there is one important distinction to the usual view on uh, semi-supervised learning or, or semi-supervised labeling. After the labels have been assigned, we compute a new classifier for the task. And this means that we don't care whether the label assignment assigns label to everything, which is usually the goal. Uh, so you want to label everything no matter how certain you are. Uh, but we can still stop and say, okay, there are some uns uh, uncertain things that are not labeled at all and only partially labeled training set will um, end up. Uh, so it's a stack classifier, more or less. Uh, so the, the basic element here is uh, clustering, actually. Uh, so the first method that we proposed was uh, cluster-based labeling. Uh, you see on the, right, uh, on the left side um, the data, and here it, uh, is actually an example from this weather data set where there are some digits and characters that are, are supposed to be recognized in tabulated forms. Uh, we compute different feature representations and actually not shown here, but we also can apply different clustering methods in order to provide in the final clustering different representations of the data. So the features are different and the cluster 
ring methods might be different. So you might uh, use a growing neural gas in contrast to, for example, generalized Lloyd or something like this. Then you getting clustered versions of your data mm, that are different uh, across the views, right? and you have several views of that. And then you ask the expert to provide a label for all the cluster centroids. Uh, therefore, here the uh, effort scales with the number of views and also the number of clusters that you're creating. And then you can um, produce a majority vote uh, because the cluster centroids will uh, propagate the label throughout the whole cluster. Uh, this is done in all the views. And then across the views, you have majority voting for the final label assignment. And if the they don't agree, uh, you have uh, only partially annotated data set in the end. And from this partially annotated data set, we train a new classifier, and this produces some results in the end. This method is working quite well if you're looking for, let's say, rather substantial classes in feature space uh, and not for rare stuff. Uh, if you're looking for rare stuff, you have a problem here because probably you don't find any cluster that uh, focuses on rare examples. Therefore, we extended this uh, by saying, OK, a different version on that, which also exploits the agreement idea is to select one sample and cast the whole thing into a retrieval problem. Uh, so we ask um, for a manual annotation for this one sample. And afterwards, we do the same thing with the multi-view representation. We compute different features. Um, but then we use this one sa label sample as a query into the rest of the data. Uh, and we cut off the, the query results at some threshold, which is unfortunately a parameter of the method that you have to decide for. Uh, but then on the safe side of your retrieval list, more or less, uh, you hope that you find consistent uh, class uh, members with your query. Uh, and if one sample appears in all the retrieval lists in the top part, then you say, OK, this is a consistent labeling, and therefore it will be added to the annotated part. Uh, and you repeat that until some abort criterion is met. Uh, and in the end, you can also obtain a partially labeled data set, and you can re also retrain on that your classifier that you had before. Yeah, what have we got up to now, you could say? Um, let's see whether the... Um, actually effort goes down. Uh, on this weather data, which is, let's say, digit and, and character recognition, um, we drew here a graph where you see the number of clusters that are formed on the x-axis and the um, recognition rate or the number of annotated samples. It's actually in the same dimension in, on y. And the solid red line is the ground truth uh, used to train a classifier and the uh, uh, black things with the error bars are the respective results you're getting when you have 30, 50, 70, and whatever clusters in this data set. was unfortunately a rather small data set. But you're seeing that rather early, you were more or less in the area of the original recognition results in this case. Uh, and uh, the, the more number of clusters you're actually having, the more labels you're also injecting in the system, and the more percentage of your data you will get labeled actually in the end. This is with the cluster-based version. The retrieval-based performance, it's a different data set. It's MNIST the digits that we use for parameter tuning at that time. Um, you see here that rather early, we reach more or less a saturation in the recognition rate, more or less. The labeling precision goes up a little further uh, if you increase the number of manual annotations. Um, but it's actually also saturating quite early. So it's uh, uh, MNIST is around 60,000 digits in the training set, so we have a few hundred labels there. We are more or less saturating. Definitely, we are not getting 0.5% error rate or something like this. So <laughs> that's true. Mm -hmm. And it's also a, a, only a very simple classifier used here. So we have more or less two um, things that we could combine. So the cluster-based labeling is uh, suitable for identifying really larger groups of samples with, uh, the, belonging to similar classes. They are problematic for rare classes, this method. Um, and the labeling scales with the number of views. So you, if you increase the views, you have to also cluster or no, label all the clusters in the other view, and that might, uh, after a while, uh, be counterproductive. The retrieval-based labeling only requires one label per exemplar and not per view. Uh, that is a bit uh, nicer, and the selection is quite smart, and it's a bit similar to this active learning procedure. It tends to assign the new labels quite sparingly, so you also might lose uh, classes, but uh, it's not so likely as in the cluster-based labeling for the, the small, let's say, uh, uh, regions in your feature space. 
Unfortunately, this has a parameter which is a bit critical. It's this cutoff threshold in your retrieval list. Um, but we have two more or less ideas, uh, the cluster-based approach and here's this smart selection approach. And it would be interesting to see what happens if we combine the two ideas. And this uh, resulted in an approach that we call partitioning-based uh, labeling, uh, which will, uh, will appear um, hopefully soon uh, in the International Journal of Pattern Recognition Artificial Intelligence. And uh, this more or less uh, combines uh, the original clustering with a later refinement step. So on the left side, you see the unlabeled data. We also compute, again, different feature representations. Uh, we add uh, a bit more to reduce the feature space into manageable dimensions. Uh, so there is a subspace projection with LSI included. And then we have different clusterings. And we're getting uh, preliminary clusters of, in your data space. The clusters are manually annotated. And afterwards, we refine this annotation in a uh, refinement step where samples are selected based on clustering quality. I will go into that in a little more detail in the next slides. And finally, the labels can be propagated to the rest of the data. Now, uh, the clustering is more or less as we had it. Uh, we compute different feature representations. We project the uh, feature space uh, down to some uh, low dimensional representation, computing topic spaces more or less. Uh, we apply clustering here, we only one algorithm, we use the generalized Lloyd in all the views independently, and then we manually label the cluster sender, so we uh, arrive at a label matrix per uh, sample instance i in every view m, uh, whether it um, belongs to class C or not. Hmm? So that's the indices here. And so more interesting is the next part. And now it's the question where to inject a new label, which will effectively later is a center or let's say starting point for a new cluster because we recompute the clustering after having another label. And here, um, René Gresti came with, uh, up with an interesting idea which is based on a modification of the so-called Dunn index, which is more or less measuring, uh, let's say, distance within a cluster um, compared to the distance to other clusters. Uh, and the modification here is that the distance to other clusters, I don't want to be, uh, bore you with uh, the detailed formulas for that, uh, but you, if you insist, I can show you later. It's measured only to clusters that belong to different classes. Uh, so if some uh, local space and feature space is subdivided into many clusters, but they all belong to the same class, it's not ha hurting this, uh, let's say, uh, quality of the labeling. But if some other classes are there, uh, then it's probably uh, problematic. Um, then we can compute per label an averaging uh, of this uh, over all the uh, labeling and then a maximization per class, uh, which means uh, that you have a, uh, let's say, a quality measure derived from the cluster precision and another quality measure that was added because that is beneficial, uh, which takes into account the distance of the current label from the respective centroids in the uh, let's say, associated cluster in the view. Oh, for, for different views, we have a quantization Q of X to some cluster, uh, and we average some inverse distance measure over that. Uh, these two scores are combined, uh, and then wherever this distance is um, lowest, uh, the lowest combined score on that distance, the quality measure is uh, lowest, uh, we decide for injecting a new label, and you can see that the red dots uh, on the right in the feature representation are new labels, uh, and these new labels are then reused um, in the cluster recomputation, and you might refine your clustering. You can iterate that, uh, usually um, with some predefined number of labeling operations that you want to invest, uh, and then some time you stop, and you have a refined clustering in the end. Finally, uh, we have to compute um, labeling for all the data, because right now only the cluster centroids have labels, and these new injected things are also effectively cluster centroids and uh, receive labels. And more or less, we um, compute an agreement um, over the labeling um, results propagated from the clusters by majority voting. Uh, so whenever uh, more than half of the number of views uh, votes uh, cluster-wise for the same uh, category, we say, OK, this is a a label that we want to trust, uh, and therefore it goes to the annotated uh, data, and the other samples will uh, be still left over as a not labeled uh, exemplars. Uh, and therefore, we have a partially labeled data set in the end on which we, however, could easily train our favorite classifier. Uh, so, in order to summarize shortly, 
unlabeled data, different feature spaces, subspace computation, a bit of a clustering, some refinement going on on the clustering stuff as long as you want to label still data, uh, and then you propagate your results to your complete data set. Uh, now let's see what happens. Uh, what we did is um, work on rather challenging data sets. So actually the 15 scenes is not so challenging, but it's uh, already natural scenes, 15 natural scenes, a few thousand images, uh, 200 uh, up to 400 per category roughly. Uh, the real one is actually the sun. Uh, so that's almost 400 natural scenes, a lot of data on over 100,000 images. Uh, and this is uh, one that only this Ebert paper that I mentioned has ever tackled with a uh, semi-supervised learning approach. Yeah, uh, the evaluation protocol, I don't want to bore you uh, too much with that, but we use the same number of potentially available training data for everything, which is a bit different from other um, um, methods for evaluate semi-supervised material. So we fixed a number of samples per category for every data set, which would be the total number of available training data. And all the rest was used for testing. The classifier in the end is a linear classifier trained on the labeled sample, uh, linear, so linear FM trained on the labeled samples. And the results are averaged over uh, five runs of that procedure because this selection of the samples was random, the training samples. Uh, now first for the 15 scenes database, the more uh, easier part, um, which was actually used for parameter or method tuning, you could say. So from left to right, uh, the number of labeled uh, samples that we are using is increasing. Uh, we have 15 scenes. Um, um, so this starts with um, 10 labeled samples per scene and extends uh, that. And uh, on the y-axis, you see the recognition rate in object recognition performance that is achieved. Uh, the PBL thingy is uh, partitioning-based labeling that uh, is now our final extension to our current uh, uh, semi-supervised methods. And we here compare to the previous things that we developed ourselves. Uh, and you see that the partitioning-based stuff outperforms both. So especially the retrieval-based thing needs quite some labels until to, uh, it takes off, really. Uh? Uh, if you have enough labels, in the end, more, most things converge uh, eventually. Uh? Now the question is, is this only outperforming our own method? Uh, no. It's also do, doing quite well uh, in comparison to this local global consistency thingy. It's not so dramatic, the difference, but it's better, especially when the labeling uh, uh, effort is, is low. And uh, it's also doing quite well in comparison to a supervised learning. Uh, eventually, a supervised will outperform this a bit. So if you use all the data with true labels, it definitely will be better than to try anything other um, uh, with uh, semi-supervised part. What is interesting, if you look at the robustness, because the labels could be wrong. Uh, even if you just ask human annotators, you never know whether they label this correctly or not. Um, we did some experiments with labeling noise. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see our method, the, the partitioning-based labeling. On the right-hand side, this local global consistency thingy. So in the end, they more or less reach the same performance. Uh, but on the way to there, you see that the labeling noise of 2 and 5% affects uh, much more uh, this LG, uh, LGC method than the partitioning-based labeling that uh, we are proposing. Now let's go for the real stuff. Uh, so this uh, Sun database, uh, where we have almost 400 classes, really challenging data set. Uh, and you see the recognition rate is now down to something very, very simple. Uh, and this uh, is because we use as a final classifier, not uh, a deep neural network, which probably even with that amount of data wouldn't be able to be trained. Uh, but it's a, a bag of features representation with uh, SIFT features extended by coordinates uh, in the quantization process. So you have a, a spatial codebook, more or less, and on top of that, a SVM classifier. Therefore, we are looking uh, at, a feature, uh, at recognition rates, which uh, more or less uh, ramp up to 15% only, which is not so impressive, but which is quite OK for the Sun database. Uh, and you, here you see now the partitioning-based labeling, the local global consistency, and the um, uh, supervised annotation part, uh, which takes off in the end when you uh, have more or less all the labels. Uh, but especially after a while, the partitioning-based uh, largely outperforms what we see in the local global consistency method. And we are quite happy about that. Yeah, let me conclude. So what you saw here 
is a new method for semi-supervised learning. It's a multi-view approach with some elements of active learning in there in the selection and refinement process. It extends a previous method which is based on clustering. And uh, especially it was applied to a really challenging task. Uh, so you can see you can use it in the real world and not only on Swiss roll or whatever toy data. It uh, outperforms quite a state-of-the-art approach here. And it also outperforms all the supervised aspects as long as the labels, let's say, that you have available are really, really scarce. No? And that's actually the main message. So if you have few labels, you can still do quite something about it. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, the supervised case always works with the labels that there are. Yeah. And so they, they stay labeled. But the semi-supervised will always l try to label as much data as it can. And so for the classifier training, in the supervised case, the classifier, because we have a stack classifier, the classifier only sees the labeled data. In the semi-supervised, it sees the true labels, let's say, and the inferred labels. Now, the training material is always the same in the, in the case of the in the case of the Sun database, we have a total of 200 images per category. Um, uh, in the beginning, let's say, we have one label per category, so one image is labeled. Uh, then you try to train a classifier uh, with 397 uh, seven, 97 labels, one per category. Oh, this will not work very well. Uh, the semi-supervised can now try to propagate this one label to something nearby and label uh, at least, let's say, a few samples in addition to that. Uh, and therefore, um, it will outperform in the beginning uh, the supervised part because the effectively labeled stuff, I including the error, are still better uh, to train a final classifier than only using the two labels. Um, the all part is not the right part. Um, the supervised exceed, that's a good question. Um, the labels are still propagated. Let me see. 397 times 200. I'm pretty sure that this is not the, the end of the labeling in sense of we have the total number of um, uh, training data labeled um, because otherwise if you have let's say completed the true labels for everything then they should be equal no? uh, but as soon as the labeling amount is let's say large enough for the supervised to take off it will outperform the same as supervised yeah they should meet again but we, uh, we uh, n normally took away this final convergence be part because that is trivial. Uh, I can't do the math online right now, but this is not completely labeled the right part because we stop uh, after a while because otherwise it will be not really useful to say semi-supervised learning without doing anything because the labels are already there. Mm, yeah, <laughs> doesn't make sense anymore. So the right part is not saying that it's a complete set, but it's, uh, let's say, the point where we see uh, that uh, the supervised learning is doing well enough so that you can't compete anymore. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, as long as it can propagate to something, it will also make errors, definitely. Oh? Uh, if, if everybody would be labeled, it wouldn't do anything. It would be the same. Uh, but as long as uh, I'm still able to, let's say, label even only 10% of the other uh, data uh, wrong, uh, I might make, uh, uh, or make up a data set which is actually not performing as well if you use it as a training set for your final classifier. Yeah, yeah we, we take out uh, the, the, the x-axis is a number of, let's say, labels in the training data. And the recognition rate is measured on the remaining data that were never seen ever before. Uh, so we... 
No, 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 um, no, no, that's, that's not true. Um, we, we take out a fixed number of samples for training for every of the two benchmarks. Right. Um, and this is the total number of training that some method might see. Right. Uh, it will never see more for training. Oh. That's a bit different from what sometimes people do in semi-supervised scenarios. They just label everything that they can label, including the test set if necessary, whatever. Uh, the test set is fixed. It was decided, uh, let's say, after the selection process that the non-200 in the Sun case, for example, are the tests for the category. And the 200 might be labeled either completely, supervised, final, whatever, or let's say only one, two, three, whatever of those. And we can propagate, but only to the rest of the 200, okay. not to the many that might be in the training set. Okay. Hmm? We want to keep that uh, strictly separate. Huh? Otherwise, you get, let's say, some mix of training and testing and whatever configuration. <laughs> Um, we have some uh, results on labeling precision. I don't have a, I don't have a view graph on that. You have seen it in the preliminary version here. Um, here we go. Here we have labeling precision with this RB, RBL. Actually, I for forgot to correct that. But that's a retrieval-based method. You see, the red thing is the actually recognition rate after the stack classifier, and the blue one is the precision of the labels that you're obtaining. And this also saturates at some point. Uh, let's say not in perfect, but in, let's say somewhere in the high 90s in this case. But so the labels will never be perfect. Yes, but this does mean that uh, once you have wrong label, the error will increase because the uncertainty increases in uh, assigning to the correct label to the uh, sample. Yeah, I think uh, this is a bit um, something that you see in what kind of classifier you're using later or not. Uh, so if your final classifier is very, very much affected by uh, wrong label assignments in your training data, uh, then you might have serious effects there. We didn't observe two serious effects of the label imprecision. Uh, um, if the classifier really, for example, density-based classifier might fail for an outlier labeled wrong and then estimate a Gaussian with, I don't know, whatever, a, a, ridicu a ridiculous tail. Mm, uh, but the SVM here is not really susceptible to some labeling noise. And the labeling noise is not too high. And you saw the comparison, no, the comparison we have here, that even if we artificially introduce label noise, not only in the, in, oops, where is it? No. Labeling noise in the true labels. Uh, so that's not labeling error, it's noise even from the annotator. Okay. Um, uh, the performance is still quite good in comparison to others that more or less trust everything and then take this more seriously, you could say. Yeah. And label precision in the previous uh, plot you showed us, uh, the uh, label precision. That's the precision of the propagation. Okay. Uh, how the, the confidence that the label is the correct one? Uh, the, the accuracy of the label. Okay. Uh, the accuracy of in inferred labels okay. measured over all the labels. Hmm? Right, and here it's the noise in the initial labels that, or the true labels that you're getting or acquiring from the annotator. So it's even one step before. Uh, therefore, I would say uh, we didn't uh, observe serious effects in this noise that we have in the data. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's definitely low. Huh? So when you're uh, talking about labeling precision in the high 90s uh, for the inferred labels, because we also don't in label something, that's probably also uh, related to that, that we don't force the system to label all the data. Uh, otherwise, you might have really areas in your data set where you are totally uncertain. Uh, you are forced to label that crap. Uh, and later, your classifier takes that for granted and goes over the cliff. Uh, and here, we deliberately stop in some point, And the propagation is only as long as we have good agreement in this multi-view approach. And so if there is no majority vote for the new label, it won't be assigned a new label a thing. It could only be that with a new labeling operation in, uh, introduced by a refinement step, we get a new sample, let's say, put somewhere because there is high uncertainty due to the clustering being crappy and whatever. New label here, clustering is refined, everything gets better in this situation, and so some of these labels might uh, be assigned later uh, because we have uh, modified the model. 
uh, but uh, that is not enforced that it does that for every uh, part of your data space. Yeah, you could you could think about some data augmentation probably. Yeah, because we, we have some noise. This is what uh, Morgan was saying. So you you could uh, expand and then wrongly label uh, uh, elements that, that are not correct. So somehow synthetic data could help in avoiding this kind of issue. Yeah, if you have a nice transform of your data which ensures that you're not uh, uh, crossing your class boundary, that's actually what the neural network guys are doing uh, in order to get uh, a deep network up on limited data. Uh, so you uh, try to produce transforms that uh, are, let's say, not spoiling the semantics of your, your input data uh, and you use it for training. It could be done here. Yeah? Uh, I, I have to say, we didn't do any fancy whatever decoration around this method because then you also wouldn't see what the method is good for. Uh, at that time, uh, also, the deep networks were probably not so uh, fashionable yet when we started it, but the classifier is also deliberately simple uh, because uh, here it's not supposed to show that we have a fancy classifier for objects or scenes, uh, but the, the labels that are generated before are okay. Mm? So the classifier to be stacked uh, is probably a decision that we took very early uh, that we found reasonable, uh, but it's a design that we never questioned also. But I think it also makes sense not to force a, a label assignment to produce labels for everything only on this rather weak assumption that uh, we might uh, somehow get all the cool similarities in the old space. Uh, if we don't do that, it's probably safer to not label things. So therefore, the classifier is not the latest uh, thing you probably would want to use as a scene classifier. Mm, therefore, the classifier is simple because we want to show that the classifier is not the thing that corrects your problem here. Mm? It's not in the classifier later uh, that we say, okay, even if the labels are crap, we still make great, great recognition performance out of it. And the classifier is also completely the same in the supervised case and in the non-supervised case. Anything else? Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much.